Today I'm here to talk to you about BIN reporting for Datomic. Um, this is roughly what, uh, what we have in store. I'm gonna give a little bit of an introduction um, because this is a, a project we did with Gaiwan. I think it makes sense to, to give you a little bit of background of who we are um, and a bit of story time about how this thing came to be, how we got started. Uh, we'll go into the problem statement, what is it exactly we're trying to solve, and then we'll go over various projects and approaches uh, of uh, things we try, some things that worked, some things that didn't work, uh, but we'll see when we get there. So, uh, who are we? We are Gaiwan. You might have seen our table and our banner outside. Um, so, we're a, a closure consultancy, been around since 2019. Uh, we're fully remote, globally distributed, um, and Basically, like I think, you know, the best way to summarize it, my co-CEO said, told me last week, like I'm seeing now what you're trying to do with Gaiwan. It's a high bar for quality combined with doing well by people. Um, that's really what it comes down to. People come to us because we're very familiar with the closure ecosystem, you know, and we help them make the best of that. Um, this is our team, or most of our team. Uh, so that's me at the top there. I'm in Belgium now, no longer in Berlin. Uh, Alice is here with me today. Uh, Joshua's down in Miami. Bettina's my co CEO in Berlin. Uh, Lawrence is in Taipei. He did a lot of the work that we'll be talking about today. And then we have June in the Philippines doing a lot of back office stuff. And then uh, Ariel, our junior in Tel Aviv, and Mitesh in, uh, in Mumbai, India. And then we have some com someone coming on in Brazil next week. So truly a, a global team. Um, these are some of our past and present clients. Uh, most of them are, are still clients today. Uh, there's, uh, the only ones that are here today, I think, are two guys from Open, uh, Justin and Andrew. Uh, so you can talk to them to see what it's like to work with us. Uh, well, today we'll be talking about Eleven and some of the stuff we did for them. Uh, IT Revolution, the company of Gene Kim. Uh, Gene was supposed to be here today, had a deadline for a book, couldn't make it. But instead he sent me this quote, it's a little small, but it has been absolutely fantastic working with the Gaiwan team since 2020. We needed someone to build mission critical capabilities that really mattered to us, including an online conference capability, video library, video editing tools. I recommend them without any reservation. Uh, and so he, he was a speaker here in 2019. You might know him from the Phoenix Project or the Unicorn Project. Uh, and he's a great guy to work with. We're very happy to have them as, a, as our client. Now, Gaiwan hasn't been around that long, but more people might recognize the name Lambda Island. Um, so I did this for a number of years, creating these short tutorial videos about various aspects of, of the closure ecosystem. Um, and a few years ago, we made, decided to make them free. So lambdaisland.com, you can find them there. Uh, and a lot of this stuff, we don't really make new ones, but a lot of this stuff hasn't really aged. You know, transducers, the basics of Datomic, uh, even reagent, you know, these things are, are pretty much timeless. So um, now, uh, when I was doing this, I started creating open source libraries and decided to use the same name for, for those. And so you might uh, actually know us uh, these days even more from, from our open source work. Uh, best known is Kaucha, uh, the test runner. Uh, we have a lot of stuff. This is not even all of it. Uh, and we're not always good at promoting it, but we did have some people come up, someone say, you know, I really love working with your URI library. Someone said, I really like uh, what you're doing with Ornament. So uh, do check these out. Um, there's an overview repository. If you go to GitHub, Lambda Island, slash open source, where we sort of give an overview of all, all the different things that, that we have and that we do. Um, okay, that's the preliminaries. Um, this story uh, also starts early 2019 uh, in Malaysia. So uh, some of you might be able to smell this slide <laughs> if, you're, if you're familiar with durian. Um, so durian is probably the most delicious food in the world. Um, it also has a, a very characteristic smell that's kind of hard to ignore. Um, and so in 2019, I was traveling with my partner uh, in Penang, Malaysia, the, the street food capital of Malaysia. And we totally got hooked on the durians. But it was out of season. They were expensive. They were hard to find. And so, um, you know, back then we were still using Twitter. And I somewhat tongue-in-cheek. I mean, it's basically a shit post. But I said, like, okay, you know, like, if I can find a client in this part of the world, 
uh, and the big urban centers are Kuala Lumpur or Singapore, then you know maybe I can come back because otherwise it, you know it's not I'm not going to come back in six months when they're in season because I just was here, but you know maybe maybe that uh, that way I, I have an excuse to come back, and uh, I get this response from uh, a certain FD Sir I didn't know yet he just said you know let's talk, uh, we exchanged some messages and this turned out to be Francois de Serre, uh, the the CTO at the time of eleven. Um, and 11 is based, uh, and I'll talk more about 11, they're, they're partly based in Singapore, partly based in Hong Kong. Um, traveling back from Malaysia, we had a layover in Hong Kong of a couple days. Francois happened to be there at the same time. I got to meet him, got to meet their CEO, Noe, uh, part of the team, and that's sort of how this whole project got going. Um, so never underestimate the power of shitposting. Um, so what are we trying to do? Uh, 11, they're building a cloud-based accounting so software for accounting firms. So their clients are big firms that do the accounting for dozens to hundreds of individual companies. And they're basically trying to build sort of next generation, modern, you know, good accounting software. Uh, it's all built in Clojure and Clojure Script, and their database is Datomic. Um, and, you know, trying to be a more modern tool, a big part of what they wanted in there is good BI. BI stands for business intelligence. Basically means being able to get insights from your data, being able to drill in and, and look at your data uh, and make business decisions based on what you learn from your data. Rather than that it's all sort of locked up in a database where you don't really see you know, what's happening, being able to slice and dice and, and get insights from that. So these days, uh, this, they have this section on their website, but at the time they didn't really have that yet. They were still building on the core product, but they were already thinking ahead, uh, you know, what, what can we do there? Um, and so they were looking at Metabase. Uh, Metabase is an open source BI tool written in Clojure, uh, and the way it works, it basically has all these different connectors for talking to different databases. So you configure your data sources, and then you can start you know, getting into that. Thank you for nodding, Jordan. That really helps. <laughs> <laughs> um, but at the time, there was no way for it to, to talk to Datomic. And all their data is in Datomic. OK, what do we do? Um, why do we want to use Metabase? There's basically two, two use cases that they're trying to, to, to provide. Uh, they want these pre-built dashboards. They, those are going to go inside the 11 app. Basically, you, know, you can navigate to a company and say, you know, show me the revenue and loss uh, or profit and loss dashboard or show me the, the ARAP dashboard. Um, and and we, we create those beforehand and people can just kind of fairly statically look at them and maybe select like the quarter or something like that. Um, and then there's a second use case, which is really self-service querying. So for this, people log into Metabase. Metabase has these pretty fancy query builders where you can, you know, just with drop downs and auto completion, you can say, select this from those tables, filter it down, join it with something else, visualize it in such and such way. Uh, and then you can save those queries, you can put them on dashboards, and, and so forth. So that's sort of the second use case. Um, to, to you know, visualize a little bit more the, what we're dealing with. So there's the 11 closure app. The user, you know, visits it from a web browser. The app talks to Datomic. Uh, we have one Datomic database for each individual company. So, so not each individual accounting firm, but each company that they do the accounting for. Um, we put Metabase next to that. Uh, Metabase has its own database where it stores stuff like user logins, uh, the databases it knows how to talk to, queries that you've saved, and so forth. Uh, and so typically, you know, when you first set it up, an admin would go in, create user accounts, set up the databases, you can start using it. And so we need to tell Metabase, you know, one of your connectors, one of your connections is, is to, you know, each of these individual Datomic databases. And so that's, that was the question. That's basically one thing that we're trying to solve. If this was Postgres, it would have been easy, or basically any common database, you know, could be Google BigQuery. Could be, you can even, I think, like hook it up to a Google Sheets or something, like all kinds of stuff, but just, just at the time, not Datomic. Um, and then for the self-service case, the user can directly log into Metabase, or for the pre-built dashboards, Basically, we need to create a dashboard in Metabase, we get an embed URL, stick that into an iframe, and the user sees it inside the app. Um, now, 
we need to set this up for several hundred companies. For each of them, uh, we have half a dozen different dashboards that need to be created. We need to create a user inside Metabase for every user that Eleven has. So we don't want to manually have an administrator go in and do that by hand. So we build a little robot. A robot's called Melvin. Um, and Melvin does that for us. Uh, Melvin does that via a project called EmbedKit. I'll talk a little bit more about that, but it's basically a wrapper that we've created open sourced to more conveniently access the, the Metabase API. Um, so, so there's really, I'll, I'll talk, I'll get the embed kit out of the way. That's really the smaller part of this talk. The bigger part of this talk is Metabase versus Datomic. They're like water and oil. How do we mix them? Metabase is mostly used for talking to relational databases. It has an internal query format that is fairly relational. Datomic is a, a triple store, a data log database. How do we close the gap? Um, to elaborate a little bit more on that, like what Datomic stores you see on the top left here, it's like entity, attribute, value, uh, or on the top right, that's sort of the same thing but represented as a map. That's how we deal it more commonly. And we want to look at that as, as if it's tables and columns. Um, and if you, if, even though these are like very different data models, if you look at it like this, it's, you basically put it sideways, right? Like it's like it should not be that hard to map one to one, especially if your data kind of looks like this. And this is how I would say most datomic usage I've seen in the wild looks like. It's like even though it's an extremely flexible model where you can mix and max, match uh, attributes across your entities, people tend to have you know, a bunch of user entities with the same attributes, a bunch of you know, line item entities with the same attributes. And so it does map fairly well to tables. Um, but yeah, like I said, EmbedKit, uh, an open source project, and, and I think one of our lesser known and, and um, projects that a lot of companies could get value out of because pretty much every SaaS product out there, you know, you could start showing your customers some more nicer visualizations. Um, and EmbedKit, we call it like Metabase as a dashboard engine. So uh, if you want to create a dashboard in Metabase, then you have to start by creating the individual queries, uh, creating a dashboard, telling for each query, you know, like this is how it's visualized and put the card top left, three wide, four high on my dashboard. It's like 20 different API calls to get there. What EmbedKit does is you give it a single Eden data structure saying, you know, here's a dashboard, these are the cards, these are the queries, this is how you visualize it, and you get the embed URL back. Um, and it does it in an item potent way, because so the next time the user visits it, we don't have to recreate that dashboard, it gets reused. So it's a small thing, but we got a lot of leverage out of it. Um, so yeah, this is what, what such an embedded dashboard could look like. So the, the, the buttons on the left are part of, of 11's frame, 11's Chrome, but then yeah, like the rest the user doesn't really know, but it's actually coming from, from Metabase. Um, some of these code slides are a little small, small, small and they're also not that important. You sort of look to, for illustration. Like this is part of that Eden data structure or like how it gets generated. Like it's not magic, this is what we're used to. Um, but okay, we're not there yet because you know, we still aren't able to actually get our datomic data into Metabase. Um, and so, like I said, Metabase has this kind of driver architecture. You can build a third party driver for a database you stick it in a jar, you put it in a plugins folder, and Metabase will find that, load that. You can now create a connection to that database. And so when I talked to, to Eleven uh, the first time in Hong Kong, they said, OK, can you, you know, start figuring out if that would be doable, uh, create a POC, proof of concept, and, and see what we can do with that. Um, and so I did. Uh, they were uh, graceful enough to, to fund this and, and let us make it open source. Um, so uh, creating a Metabase driver is implementing a bunch of meta, meta, uh, multi-methods. Uh, basically, it's saying, here's the details of the database connection. Tell me which tables there are. Here's a table. Tell me which columns there are. 
Here's an MBQL query, which I'll show, which is just an, an Eden data structure for a metabase query. Uh, give me back a native query, so that means like an SQL, or in our case, a data log string. And then here's a native query, give me back the results. There's a few more, but that's, that's basically it. The, those last two are split because also in the Metabase UI, you have the choice of using their query builder or writing your own native query. And so this, is, this was actually really cool. Like once we got this thing going, it actually became this really nice like Datomic client. We could just go in there and like write a data log query and see the results and visualize it. Oh, that was kind of fun. Um, this is what MBQL looks like. I'm just showing this to say that like, even though it looks nothing like SQL, actually it's, it's basically SQL. It's like, you know, from this table, select those fields, filter by this thing. Uh, the numbers refer to IDs in Metabases database. You have to resolve those, and, but yeah. We generate something like this. It's a bit bulky. It's data log, like not exactly how you would write it. We have some rules about how we generate those, those logic variables and so forth. Um, but yeah, so we, we transform one into the other. Um, mostly that was not that hard, but there's a few subtleties where data log has different semantics than SQL. So even though these queries superficially look very similar, the data log one, when you say, you know, give me the, the user emails, you'll only get results back of entities that have a user email. Whereas in the SQL one, you might have entries in your users table where there's an ID, but there's no email, and so you get nulls back, but you still get the IDs back. And so we had to kind of emulate that behavior. That's why you see that or join at the bottom. Uh, some hacks we found out. There's some good documentation, like I wrote a lot of ADRs while doing this project, so even though we kind of archived the project, I think it's still interesting stuff that people could look at, sort of how we, how we solve these things. Um, one cool thing, the fact that we did it ourselves, that we could sort of tweak it to our own use case, we, we did this Eden configuration where you could say, oh, you know, on a, on a journal entry line, also pretend that there's a fiscal year field on there, even though there's not, and to populate it, do a resolution via three other foreign keys, lookups, you know, these kind of things. Um, was quite cool, quite powerful. Um, so, you know, worked reasonably well, we were happy, performance was okay, uh, was great to have, you know, full control, uh, was easy to add the features we needed. So we started rolling with it, uh, and then the next version of Metabase comes out and it breaks. Uh, and like in no small way, like the MBQL syntax had significantly changed, it was basically okay, you know, like, do we do a rewrite? Um, and so we, we decided to punt on that, stick with the older version of Metabase for a while. Uh, and this, this has been a little bit of a theme working with Metabase, that it seems they haven't fully internalized sort of the, the closure culture of not, not breaking your downstream consumers. Um, we've also noticed the same thing in their, in their HTTP API. Um, but later that year, um, the choice was made for us because Datomic Analytics came out. Um, so this is the announcement from September 2019 that was basically right before the last conch. So that was the big announcement then. This year we had a different Datomic announcement. Um, release for Datomic Cloud and Datomic on-prem. That reminds me to mention that like everything I'm talking about is on-prem. I've used cloud, but I'm not that familiar with cloud. Some of the takeaways might be different if you're dealing with cloud. So I'm, I'm talking about on-prem here. Um, so Datomic Analytics, the left uh, table are basically your, your triples in Datomic. Uh, these are products, and then given a little bit of configuration, you get a, a virtual SQL table with, with your products, and then there's a cardinality many attribute in there, so it creates these join tables. Um, the way uh, it works is Datomic Analytics, Analytics is really just a driver for Presto. So, Similarly to how we created a driver for Metabase, they created a driver for Presto. Presto, you can think of it as a database without a storage layer. So it's a, it's a complete SQL engine with its own SQL dialect um, that can talk to all kinds of different data sources. Uh, and you can even query across those, which is very cool. 
Um, it has its own binary wire protocol, or there's also a JDBC interface. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's, that's what Datomic Analytics is, Datomic Driver for Presto. Um, you give it a, a meta schema Eden file um, based on these membership attributes. So this is what that meta schema looks like here. In this case, it would create a users table because I've, I've changed the name there, uh, an event table and a product table. So kind of based on these prefixes. And then in those tables, you find everything with the same prefix. So if there's like a user email, then that would go in there as well. And in this case, I've also said that in my users table, anything that uh, the profile URL on the user, I wanna, I wanna see that in there as well. So that's, that's how that works. Um, and there was a lot of things that we liked about that. Um, you know, like the, it, just like with Datomic, uh, Metabase Datomic, it connects directly to your, to your production database. So your data is always live. And it's kind of nice with Datomic that you can do that without too much risk because of the peer model where a lot of the querying happens inside your, your local process rather than in some shared database process. Um, JDBC and SQL are universal. You know, suddenly you can talk to basically anything. Um, we, uh, we enjoyed working with Presto, powerful uh, SQL engine, like I said. And we can create views in there, and that was relevant to our use case. Um, and then finally, you know, like, now someone else is maintaining it, you know? We no longer have to make the choice of like, you know, do we do the rewrite or not? So that, you know, that, that helped to make the choice as well. Um, these views are important because if you go back to the self-service querying, um, you know, you can say here, join this table to that table to that table, but we have a very normalized data model. Uh, so to get useful data, you basically need to join like all these tables. So you need deep knowledge of the data model. We can't expect a user, like even if they would know it, it's just terrible UX. So what we did instead was, you know, do a, a create view, basically create a virtual table that exposes, you know, just one line for each journal entry line with all the data related to it, all on like this very wide table, and then you can query that uh, and get everything you need. Um, we did have some pain points with Datomic Analytics. Um, was more operational overhead, uh, no lack of public roadmap, uh, which was again blocking our metabase upgrade and some issues around performance. So, you know, this, this might not be a big deal for, for some companies, but metabase was a small company, only a couple people kind of part-time dealing with the, with the ops stuff. Uh, and so before we were running a transactor, we had to run metabase and, and the app itself, of course. Now we need to run a peer server because Datomic Analytics uses the Datomic peer API, so you need to be running a peer server. Uh, and then Presto as well. And the thing is like the transactor, the peer server, Presto, um, since they're all kind of doing database-y stuff, they're all you know, doing local caching to, to be performant enough. And so you're really like puzzling. It's like how much memory does each of these need? Playing around with the JVM heap size, you know, these kind of things. Um, was also just the fact that there's you know three hops between you know your data and and the UI, you know where where is stuff going wrong? There's there's troubleshooting gets more complex, but okay this was all in all fairly minor. We were we could you know we could deal with this. Um, lack of a public roadmap uh, for this I need to uh, explain a little bit more history. So. Uh, Presto, originally called PrestoDB, was maintained by Facebook, as I said, but then the people who created it left Facebook and uh, created a, a Presto Software Foundation that managed its own fork, developed its own fork uh, as a community project. And so naturally that one got more traction. Uh, they called it Presto SQL. So now we had Presto formerly PrestoDB, which is something different than Presto SQL, not confusing at all. Um, so they renamed it to Trino. And that's sort of where, you know, where most of the community mindshare is today. Um, now, notice the timing, you know, 2018, 19, 20 is sort of when this stuff was happening. The Atomic Analytics came out in 2019. They are based on Presto. Um, the latest upgrade of Datomic that mentions Datomic Analytics 
is from January 2021, so that's over two years ago. Um, and it's uh, based on Presto 348, which is a version that is still largely the same between the two sides. After that, Trino went a bit more its own way. And so we don't really know what's going to happen now, right? Like, it seems things have gone a little quiet around the atomic analytics. Um, you don't really know until they come out with something new what's, what's going to happen. Um, and in the meanwhile, Metabase has also made the switch. The wire protocol between these two, because they're using the binary protocol, it's changed a little bit. And so now we can no longer use the latest version of Metabase with Presto. Uh, so we're kind of back where we were in the beginning, except now, you know, even if we wanted to, we can't really solve this problem. We have to wait until they solve it for us. Um, so that was fairly annoying. Um, but then finally, uh, we had major issues around performance. And I don't want to, like, this is not, you know, a blanket, the atomic analytics is slow. I think for a lot of use cases, it works absolutely fine. Um, I think it had a lot to do with the fact that we do these extremely wide joints. Uh, and, and, you know, this is all fairly black box, so we can only assume. But my understanding is that basically, Presto needs to query all these individual tables and then join them at the Presto level it doesn't really know what storage looks like, what indexes look like. It can't really optimize that. And so our press is, our, once we started moving like past you know, toy size data, our queries started taking minutes, started timing out. Uh, so this was a real problem. This was a blocker. And so we had to take a step back. Um, and uh, yeah, so yeah, again, talking about these wide views, uh, we had to take a step back and see, okay, what, what are we gonna do about this? Um, and that's when we, we came up with Plenish. Uh, it's a pretty simple idea. Basically, uh, Datomic provides a transaction log. Uh, everything's in there. Let's just take transaction by transaction and use that to keep uh, another relational database, in our case, Postgres, up to date. Um, we took some ideas from the atomic analytics around configuration um, and uh, yeah, created that. It, we've kept it open, uh, closed source until now, but we've, we've open sourced it uh, just before the conference. Um, so uh, if you have you know, similar needs, if you wanna try it out, uh, do, do check it out and, and maybe get in touch if you have any questions about it. Um, Datomic transactions contain both schema changes and data changes. Uh, and so we basically do the same thing. So in uh, your Postgres, we'll create a transactions table. We'll also create an idents table so that you can map uh, numbers to idents if you do use them for enums or things like that. Uh, and then, and that way we, we can always see what's the latest transaction that we've processed. Uh, each datomic transaction gets wrapped into an SQL start and commit so that we never commit half a transaction so we know exactly like where we are in the, in the sync process and can pick that back up. And then as, as we see that the schema evolves, we also evolve the schema in, uh, in Postgres. Uh, we use the same idea of the membership attributes, um, but in our case, instead of looking at the prefix, we basically say, uh, okay, this entity contains the membership attribute, so it's part of the table. What other attributes does this entity have at this time? And we create columns for, for all of those if they don't exist yet. Um, so, and, and you know, it's a, it's a trade-off. Um, we do lose some of the benefits that we had today, uh, that we had before. Uh, like I said earlier, when you're talking to the Atomic directly, you know, your data is always live. Whatever you do in your app, it immediately shows up in your, in your BI, in your dashboards. In this case, there's a, an ETL step basically in, the, in between, uh, and so there's a little bit of lag there. We, we can throw more resources at it to reduce that lag, uh, but, but it's definitely there. Um, there's also a bit more orchestration needed, so before we could just, you know, we hook into the database and the data is there, now we have this loop running somewhere that needs to go over all the individual databases, see how far behind we are, process the new transactions. There's a bit more stuff going on. But, you know, good news is uh, we can upgrade to the latest metabase and, and stay up to date. And uh, 
performance has been great. We're, we're only using Postgres, which isn't necessarily an analytics database. Uh, so, so in the database world, they, they generally make a distinction between OLTP, which is online transaction processing, which is what your, your application does as you, you know, make changes to your data one by one, these changes get transacted. And there's OLAP or OLAP, which is your analytics processing, which are very different kind of workloads. Uh, and so for this, you typically use uh, column stores that, that rather than storing your data row by row, store it column by column, can more efficiently do analytical queries that way. Um, but we're not particularly doing like big data, we're at best doing awkward size data. Uh, <laughs> Postgres is a, is a fantastic, you know, all around database that we were familiar with and that, that you know, for, for most use cases has, has more than adequate performance. So we've been running with that. Um, like I said, it would be fairly easy to adopt, to uh, adapt Plenish to work with other databases. It's, we just used JDBC uh, in the end. There might be some differences in, in SQL dialect and in, in, uh, in data types because we had to map the, the primitive, the atomic data types to equivalent Postgres data types. But you know, if you wanted to use it to go to, to uh, what is it uh, people use these days, Snowflake or, or whatever, like you can, you can do that. Um, this is what it looks like using Plenish. It's just a library. You need to use it in your application. You connect to the atomic, you connect to Postgres, you give it a meta schema you say sync. This is the, the high level API, there's a more low level API where you have a bit more control if you wanna specifically you know, deal with, uh, the, what this does is go to Postgres, look at that transactions table, say what's the latest we have, now give me the transaction log from Postgres of everything we don't have yet, and start, start processing that. Um, yeah, and that's it. Uh, I ran a little faster than, uh, than during my test runs uh, so I wasn't expecting to have time for questions, but maybe, yeah, let's maybe do a couple questions. Uh.